Uh, can you see the, the title screen? Yes, we can. Great. So I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak to council. It's, it was an interesting study. Uh, happy to be able to share the results and to uh, entertain any questions you might have. The parking strategy came from the downtown, downtown's master plan that was completed a couple of years ago. It was one of three supporting strategies that was recommended. And from that downtown's master plan, part of my takeaways were, first of all, the uh, fairly detailed inventory that was done of both parking supply and demand. This was very helpful in the analysis work that uh, was done as part of the strategy. Um, the study included, as you know, a, a list of action projects involving uh, streetscape changes that could involve uh, changing two-way streets or one-way streets to two-way, for example, or increasing the pedestrian realm. And these all have the uh, potential of reducing some on-street parking that was part of the consideration. Uh, the study, and, and this is a quote directly from the recommendations, suggested that the city takes a leadership role in downtown parking provision through collaboration, efficient organization, design, and operation strategies to ensure municipal owned and private downtown retail and commercial parking supply. So taking that was part of uh, forming the purpose of the, the parking strategy. It was to look at the city's role in the ownership operation planning and regulation of parking. Uh, we looked at the value and impact of implementing paid parking in the downtowns, along with new technologies that would be used potentially to implement that. Uh, the role of parking supply and utilization as a tool in economic and municipal development management was considered as was the best way to manage parking demand in residential neighborhoods. So I'll spoil the, the ending by giving it away here. The, the recommendations out of the strategy were to add new staffing time, and this is necessarily new positions. It could be uh, new tasks assigned to existing positions, but to look after uh, the issue of parking enforcement and planning and management. Uh, one of the things that did come through in the engagement was that there, there really is nobody on city staff who is the parking person. Uh, if, if someone from the community has a question or, or complaint or issue related to parking, there's really no one specific person that would, uh, that would be in charge of dealing with them. Um, also, the recommendation to introduce pay parking into the downtowns using multi-space pay stations, and this was also a, a recommendation in the downtown's master plan. Uh, one of our first tasks was to, uh, to do a, a scan of other jurisdictions and how they handle parking issues. We sent a, a fairly detailed survey to uh, 21 of the largest uh, urban centers in the plan Canada. Those 21 got responses from six, uh, three of which are in, in New Brunswick, and this was really uh, helpful information that we summarized in the, in the report. In addition to that, we did a scan of, of all 21 of the those urban centers uh, to get information that is available on, on a website and through uh, Google Street View, for example. And, and one of the elements of information that we got was to just do a scan of how many of the cities and towns charge for on-street parking in the downtowns. And if you, if you look at just the, uh, the Nova Scotia urban areas, it, it really isn't stratified the way I thought it would be in terms of population. So there are some, the, the two larger cities uh, have pay parking. Uh, a couple of the larger towns, Turbo and Kentville, don't. But some of the smaller towns, uh, Anaganish and Liverpool, at 4,000 and 3,000 populations do charge for parking on streets. So it, it's clearly not a, uh, a population related issue the way it, it is more so in New Brunswick, where uh, the three larger cities all charge for parking downtown and the smaller cities don't. So in this chart, uh, Miramichi would, would fall in between Fredericton and Edmonston in, in population. So kind of right on that uh, 
that horizon of of whether you charge for parking or or not so made it interesting in that sense we did extensive community engagement as part of the the study did a number of one-on-one interviews with both city staff members and some of the key stakeholder groups that were identified for us there were two online surveys undertaken one specifically targeted business we also had a survey that was posted on the engaged mayor machine website where we got information back from from the public and then there was some follow-up consultation offered with the downtown business associations once the the final report was put in place I'll just share with you a little bit of the the survey data that we got from both surveys one of the questions that was asked of the businesses was do your employees or customers complain about a lack of parking and then to the public we asked do you yourself have trouble finding a parking spot I should mention that that this question was asked separately for parking in Chatham and parking in Newcastle that the numbers were fairly close between the two there wasn't really a substantial difference so so this chart is just an average of the two so you can see for the the business owners 50% of them said customers employees frequently complain but then on the other side I guess 43% said they rarely or never complain so quite quite a difference in opinion there for the public response it's fairly close to to a nice bell curve where you know most people are kind of in the in the middle ground and and very few on the extremes of finding it either very difficult or very easy to find parking another question we asked was do you think parking meters are a good idea for mayor machine or a bad idea and some interesting responses here I thought going into this it would be surprising if anybody said it was a good thing it's always challenging in a survey to ask a question along the lines of do you want to start paying for something that you currently get for free because most people don't but but this was I think a good indication that people do see some value in paying for parking in the downtown there there's a slide later on in the presentation where I touch on that a bit but the majority of the business owners a slight majority thought it was a bad thing but from the public perspective it was almost a 50-50 split on whether it was a good thing or a bad thing I had some discussion with staff members through the interviews trying to get some idea of what the right model for governance of parking might be and I tend to classify it into kind of three broad groups one is a hands-off approach where the the city says we're not in the business of parking that's up to the downtown businesses we won't provide any parking if the businesses don't provide enough that's their problem let the market decide there and there are some cities that that do take this approach it's not common but it is it is used there's a city influence model where the city is not the owner of parking doesn't manage and own parking lots but does put in policies and other measures to in an effort to make sure that there is enough parking for the demands that are produced by the downtowns and that can be done through things like taxation breaks for for providing parking having parking minimums imposed and and other planning techniques that are used to try to make sure that the supply is provided and then the third general group is the is the city led model where the city takes an active role in both providing and managing parking in the downtowns and that city led model can be done a number of ways it can be done by creating a city department for parking and that's not necessarily needed either it could be an existing parking that just takes on the role of an existing department that takes on the role of parking it could be a commission for parking and and in Miramichi you're familiar with commissions I know there are are several of those already or it could be done through a private sector parking agency companies like in park and indigo are ones that will take over the role of managing parking for you in exchange for 
uh, revenue sharing. And, and these three uh, techniques kind of go from, from the top to the bottom in terms of what uh, influence city council might play in parking management. If it's a city department, obviously you have uh, quite a quite a close role with how this is managed. Whereas if you uh, decide to go out to a private sector parking in agency, you can, can set some broad parameters under which they operate, but the day-to-day -day decisions would be would be left to them. Uh, just some thoughts on, on the idea of paying for parking in, in Miramichi. Um, I, I've learned through the engagement that Miramichi, uh, like a number of, of cities similar to it, uh, once had parking meters and they were removed uh, when the suburban big buck commercial development began to appear. Just the, the thought that uh, the downtowns now needed to compete with these, these uh, other commercial uses and, and that uh, free parking was necessary to, to make that happen. The thought is starting to shift now in terms of, of that and the idea of whether or not uh, providing free parking in downtowns is really equitable given that uh, other commercial areas have the responsibility and the cost of, of bearing that, their own cost and it, it is quite a large cost to, to provide parking uh, that they, they take on that, that burden themselves. Um, Compliance and enforceability is, is improved with parking meters, uh, certainly compared to time-limited parking, which is uh, currently in place. It's very difficult to, uh, to, to properly enforce time-limited parking, uh, and parking meters can, can improve that. And they can also increase space availability, which is, is valued by, by many people. Uh, when it's free parking in, in high-demand areas, typically all the spaces are taken. Uh, and it's really difficult to find a space unless you have circled the block a few times. With pay parking and, and, and parking meters, uh, quite often uh, more availability is, is there that you can find a space when you need it. You, you now have to pay, but, but some people uh, value the ability to, to find a space even if they have to pay for it. If, if pay parking is introduced, there are a number of, of techniques and technologies to do that. On the left is the classic coin-fed parking meter that you're all familiar with. These are, are starting to become uh, pretty much extinct now. And, and I think you can appreciate the reason for that is that, that people uh, just don't carry cash anymore. The, the expectation is that pretty much any transaction they do now can be done with a, a credit or, or a debit card. And, and parking meters are currently the one rare exception where, where you still need to have cash. So to, to be able to, to meet that desire, uh, one of the techniques is, the, is a, called a smart meter. And this is a, a picture from Moncton uh, where they're quite happy with their, their smart meters. Uh, a smart meter is, uh, there, there's one of these meters at every parking space. So uh, you pull up to a parking space and the meter will be right there. You can use coins or you can use your card. Uh, I'm not sure if it accepts tab or not, but certainly you can insert a card. Um, and then there's the idea, more, more common to that is the multi-space multi pay station. So instead of one uh, device at every parking space, there's, there's one device for every block where there's parking. So you would park your car, uh, look for the nearest pay station, uh, go to that, uh, you punch in your license plate number and how much time you would like to pay for, and then again you can make the transaction either with coins or with your with your card. Uh, the really the value of the multi-space pay station is you don't need that expensive technology at as many locations. The, the smart meters again, you, you need one of these devices for every space, so it can become fairly costly and fairly difficult to, uh, to service and maintain. Then combined with all of these on, on the right is the, is the smartphone app, and, and that can be applied to, to any of three of these, these devices. And I use Hotspot as an example here. Hotspot uh, is just one of, of several uh, options available for, for paying for parking, but it just has, has really dominated the, the Atlantic uh, Provinces market. It's it's pretty much exclusively used through through all of the uh, the cities that that uh, that use paid parking. So so with the the app on your phone, 
now you can park, you don't need to find the pay station, you just start up the app you log on to your account where you've registered the license plate of of all the vehicles in your domestic fleet so you just indicate what zone or what parking lot you're parked in how much time you would like to pay for and then you click on the red park button and you're all set one of the the real benefits of these apps is if for example you were parked to go to a dentist appointment and you paid for 45 minutes thinking that would be plenty and you get into the dentist's office and they're all backed up and running late and and you're you're there for 40 minutes and you know you've only got five minutes left on the meter and rather than having to tell the receptionist you have to run out and plug the meter all you do is you start up your app add another 20 minutes or 30 minutes and and you're all set and then conversely if you've if you've paid for more parking than you need and you get back to your car and you realize you have 20 minutes left on the meter you just click a button on the app and it refunds the the unused time back to your account so it's it's really a wonderful tool for for people certainly a really customer friendly thing and it helps to I think ease the pain of adding cost to parking in the in the report I did just a summary of the projected costs for implementing pay parking in Miramichi so that the startup capital cost to to purchase and pay for the the pay stations as well as the devices that are needed for collecting coins out of the out of the machines and the enforcement devices would be about hundred eighty thousand dollars the the added annual operating cost and I emphasize added because there's a lot more operating costs than just what I've included here which is kind of the new staffing and the the contract to operate the technology there's the cost of plowing the parking lot of painting the lines of patching the the cracks of putting up the signs when they get knocked down all of these costs you're you're bearing now so that certainly can can cut into a lot of the revenue but this is just really the the incremental cost that you don't bear now and that's up against a projected annual revenue of seven hundred forty thousand dollars and that's based on the hourly and daily parking rates that I've included in this table I think these were taken pretty much from from similar cities that that have pay parking now they're they're at the kind of the average to low end I think it would be valuable to to introduce a fairly low rate to start off with to kind of get over the sticker shock I guess this is a map that was included in the report just to give a sense of of where the parking spaces are and where the demand is in the downtowns this is for Newcastle there was a similar map for for Chatham included in the report as well it's just a tool that could be used to decide where additional parking is is maybe needed based on where the demands are and and speaking of adding more city parking that was a recommendation of both this parking strategy and the downtown's master plan and rather than including in the plan you know a dot on the map saying here's where you should add 50 more parking spaces really the best approach is to is to look for opportunities to work with developers as new projects are proposed for the downtown to see if there's an opportunity to to work jointly with the developer to create new parking spaces that could be shared some of them would be perhaps exclusive to that business and some would be city owned and just to kind of illustrate an example there's a diagram which I've included on this slide don't look at it too closely because it's not really a specific recommendation it's just a general idea of the way this could take place this is an example where a bank has some customer owned or some customer limited parking in the back and as well as some some vacant space so with some capital money infused by the city the parking space could be optimized and paved and 
and some of the vacant land developed to increase the number of parking spaces and then working with the bank to create an agreement where some of the spaces would be signed for bank customers only and the rest would be signed for public parking, potentially for pay parking. And then just some concluding thoughts kind of over and above the recommendations, I guess, is the idea of considering installing the pay parking stations first on the street but leaving the public lots free. This might be a good way of encouraging some migration to the parking lots. Maybe some people who don't use the parking lots now might try them out when they're free and parking on the street is not. And then after people get used to using the parking lots, some payment could be introduced after a year or maybe two years. I'll mention that some cities that are in the process of introducing pay parking in downtown sometimes will take the step of earmarking a portion of that revenue specifically for infrastructure or for programs or even for special events in the downtown just to help to overcome the issues around the introduction of pay parking. I mentioned in the models, one of the models for cities that are parking rather than doing it internally might be to pass that task on to a commission. And that doesn't necessarily have to be the creation of a new parking commission. It could be a task that an existing commission such as the regional service commission takes on. I think parking might be a nice fit for the regional service commission if that was a consideration to enter into discussion with them. I can tell you asking a group like that to take on a new task is a whole lot easier when some revenue comes along with it, which is the case with parking. I did approach the idea with them when I had my one-on-one discussion. And I guess what I can tell you about that is they didn't hang up on me at least. So there was some qualified interest in considering that. And then just a warning that the revenue projections that were on the previous slide are based on kind of industry accepted values for parking demand based on the nature of businesses that are in place. And these are not COVID influences. They're kind of the normal parking demand. And that's what the revenue was generated on. And I just make note that some of the cities I'm aware of have reported parking revenues being reduced by between 30 and 50 percent, depending on the area, just due to the reduced demand from COVID. So when I put up the figure of $740,000 in revenue, if you were to introduce pay parking tomorrow and came back to me a year later and said you didn't get your $740,000, I would say the reason is because that's a projection based on normal type times. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. Before I end up, I'd just like to acknowledge the assistance of Paul McGraw in this study. He had a really good, gave some really good leadership, a really good vision of what the questions that needed to be answered were. And he made certain that we really extended the engagement request to the degree that we could. So my thanks to Paul for that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are some. So we'll go first to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was very thorough. I appreciate that. My question would be around, you know, if this were to be the strategy that we move forward with, how long is that implementation phase? Like how soon or how long from now would we see those meters in the downtowns? Just, and I went through this process with Halifax Regional Municipality. I was parking manager there for a number of years. It's a bit of a lengthy process. There's some work I think you want to do beforehand just to do some more work, you know, potentially on things like what the rate you would charge and where the machines would be located. But it's really 
these companies that provide parking devices like this are really geared up for a turnkey operation. so if you were to and engage with one or or to have an open request for for proposals or expressions of interest they could certainly work with you to make sure you you get what you need and that kind of the you know the whole back office to to process the credit card payments is is set up and i i would suggest it it could be a year or two to a year and a half from from the time you you began engaging the or or issued the request for expressions of interest thank you very much thank you counsel that concludes argument in this case attorney mccarthy and attorney ellis you should disconnect from the hearing at this time
Uh, we basically said enough is enough. We've got to try to. We've done everything we possibly can of going door to door to try to get and plead with them uh, to buy them. Nothing has happened. So I'm I'm confident that we can do everything possible. Uh, if every uh, uh, business through their business associations the opportunity to provide input here, and uh, in some cases. Some really good input. In other cases, we got no nope, but what first school. Uh, it was unfortunate, it was disappointing, um, but I'm, I'm confident that we, we did our diligence to try to make sure that this was as complete report as possible as the public engagement goes. Thank you. Follow yeah, up if still I may. To you, still to you, Councillor. Yeah. So I appreciate that, and I, and I understand how that all, all worked out. Um, on a personal note, I think it's, uh, you know, the parking strategy was very important and it's uh, in keeping with our downtown development plan. And, you know, it's even if we went at a fast pace, it would still be a one and a half to two year process to, to get it going. So I would be inclined to go with a, a nice slow release. And as the city grows and and development happens it's important that this is incorporated into all of that and it's you know to your point it's unfortunate that they didn't participate but uh we must go on thanks councillor uh councillor johnston thank you your worship and uh mr mccluster your presentation was both insightful and informative um it's interesting to see how other municipalities larger than ours and around similar size tackle the issue of parking. It is indeed a bit of a contentious issue here by times. Um, I will speak specifically to the west side, the Newcastle side. It has been a bit challenging. Um, I'm sure that in Chatham as well, there's been some issues with uh, parking from time to time. <clears throat> I'm wondering when you mentioned the parking strategy that recommends the paid parking and the downtown master plan, is that being, and perhaps this is a question for our city manager or perhaps even your worship, is that being done in concert with the downtown redevelopment plan that would see the implementation of a light at the base of the town hill and reduction of parking spaces in the former town of Newcastle. Is that the same strategy, same plan, or is yeah. that a different initiative? Yeah, those are, those, all of that is in the, the singular downtown uh, redevelop, downtown's redevelopment plan, um, which uh, Councillor, I'll always take the opportunity to remind the public as well, can be found in full on our website, uh, including all of the renderings of the pro proposed projects and what they'll look like when they're done, yeah. Thank you, I just, um, I, that's what I suspected. I just thought uh, in the interest of clarity, that we would get that on the record. So when we talk about uh, community engagement, and, I, and I'm not uh, sure, uh, Mr. McCusker, if Mr. McGraw has um, uh, ex explained to you that there have been some uh, challenges with consultation, the consultation and communication piece in the city with select files over the past uh, several years. And one of the things that um, I'm very sensitized to and want to make sure we get right the first time around is the consultation and community piece. You had referenced the fact that there has been extensive community engagement and um, Mr. Uh, McGraw's uh, further comments have, have helped me gain some insight into the extensive efforts that you guys ha have taken and I do appreciate that. Um, although you didn't get any response from the Chatham Business Association, which was again, as my colleagues have indicated, unfortunate. I'm just wondering, um, with the 14 responses you did get, even though we're talking about one association, that is still but a portion of those businesses. I guess my question goes to, uh, did you go and speak to the individual business owners in this business association, the Newcastle side as well, as your efforts to do that sort of thing in chat? Uh, the, the approach that was taken was to, to go through the, the business association itself. Uh, we did ask 
that they uh, communicate this information to their members and to solicit uh, from as many members as, as they could. I, I'm not sure uh, how extensive that turned out to be, but we did rely uh, just on the, the business association as the kind of the umbrella group without going uh, specifically to, to individual businesses ourselves. Still to you, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I could, if I could, really quickly though, for context, and perhaps uh, Mr. McGrath, you want to add too, if we're not going to make the same point, is that this is the model that we have regularly used to consult businesses in the downtown associations, is to work in partnership with the associations, who uh, you know we we communicate with the associations, and then they communicate to their members on our behalf. Uh, so it's sort of been a the model we've been using. Um, yeah, just to make make that point. And Paul, if you want to add, I, I yeah, the, the, thank you very much for to to, 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 be, to compare the difference in response uh, between the Newcastle Business Association and the Historic Business Group. Um, when we when we ask for input and response to the survey um, that were online, we asked that that of the capital. We received a 50-page, can't sometimes take them written, sometimes type read from the historic, from the down to the Newcap business group, uh, expressing all of their concerns. And correct me if I'm wrong, this was over and above the 14 that, that answered the survey online, correct? Correct, yes. So there was a significant, when, when, when I mentioned Julio, that there was a significant difference in the response between Historic Chatham and, and the downtown Newcastle district. Um, it was not necessary to go to the Newcastle Business District on an individual basis because we already had their responses. They were they were quite um, effective in getting the message out to their members and having the members react accordingly um, to what we were requesting. Uh, it, it was actually the exact opposite of what we face with the historic Chatham Business District Group. Just to, just for context. Back to you, Councillor. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Paul, Mr. McGraw. Thank you. Um, that uh, contextual piece does help my insight into what was done. Uh, my concern being that um, a generic consultation strategy via the association may not solicit the specific details from the individual business owners that perhaps were needed, but if you got that in the form of a written report with handwritten notes as you've stated, um, that's a uh, job well done. Thank you. Just worth, I think, noting as well that uh, moving forward now, we've got the Engage Miramichi website, which can be used for any and all public consultations, whether that's members of the public or businesses, and we'll have the communications officer in short order as well, who, whose part of their role will be to help with these engagements. Um, I don't see any other hands. We'll keep it open. I've got a couple of questions, um, so I'll take, uh, take those now. And uh, I guess I would just state, I, I, it to me, on the matter of consultation, it looks like due diligence and then some was done in every regard. So I have no concerns there. I do want to thank Mr. McCusker for the the report um, with a lot of detail. Uh, I think that this does give us the ability now uh, internally for staff to take these pieces out and come back to council with a proposed path forward. I think it's all in here and then some. So now it'll just be a matter of picking some of the pieces. There'll be a few decisions to make, but I'm excited about it. And I just want to highlight um, that, you know, for, from my perspective, the biggest issue we were trying to address here, which we've heard about, I've heard about since as long as I've been at this table, was how do we uh, get, get people all day parkers out of on-street parking? So and we've heard it in both downtowns. Uh, there are many people, whether they're working in offices or in some cases in the shops, uh, that go there and park all day. And we know that that's not the best practice. We need all day parkers in lots and we need on street parking to be for shorter term uh, parkers. Uh, Mr. McCusker, one area in I've read your whole report as well, where I'd like to ask about that is, is, you know, I guess I didn't see any recommendations in regard to time limits for on street parking. Uh, and I know when we get these reports, usually then um, there'll be an opportunity for members of council to ask questions or ask for additional information. So 
would you be able to make a comment tonight and or include it into the report what your recommendation would be for time limits for the on-street parking and also for a suggested um, fine schedule? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, I, I could sh share with you some of my experience in Halifax when I was manager there. We, we had uh, a, a range of, of time limits in downtown, but the, uh, the downtown businesses kind of put their heads together and said they felt uh, 90 minutes was kind of the, the sweet spot where, you know, people do have uh, lunch engagements that typically take more than an hour, but if it's two hours, that's that's starting to hot the spot. So, so they, they felt uh, 90 minutes was was about ideal. One one of the things uh, that was done in Halifax and is done in some other cities as well is to have um, escalating parking rates. So that, for example, you might pay uh, one dollar an hour for the first hour, but if you want to park a second hour, it's two dollars, and if you want to park a third dollar, third hour, that's three dollars just just for that that one hour and the idea there is that you know there, there won't won't be a strict time limit but if you park uh, longer than that is typical then then you start to pay a lot more for that uh, so it's it, it, it kind of achieves what you're, you're trying to do is to, to limit the on-street spaces for short-term parkers but on the other hand you're not uh, you know, making it difficult for somebody, if it, if it is a one hour limit, who for whatever reason, again, I'll use my uh, dentist's office and the dentist is behind schedule, uh, caused you to be a little late getting back and, and your time limit is up. You could, you could pay to, to get an extra hour, it's just that you, you pay a whole lot more. It's, it it's a, makes it a little extra level of, of complication, I think, I think for the users, but just, you know, philosophically, it's the uh, uh, kind of a nice thing to do, but uh, kind, kind of long way of, of getting around to it, I guess. I, I would suggest that the, the time limit you have now of one hour is probably good, or if, if not one hour, to, to limit it 90 minutes. Um, I, I'm not sure what, what to suggest about the, the fine schedule. Cities have, have quite a variety of of, of fine levels that they that they impose. It would uh, typically the, the fine for uh, parking too long at a, at a parking meter would be done through your your streets and, and parking bylaws. So you can you can set the rate yourself. It's um, it, it, it's again kind of a, trying to find that that sweet spot where it's uh, not too onerous on the uh, uh, the person and, and scares people away from. Uh, from using downtown parking, but still, it at least gives you what you want in terms of uh, compliance with the with the regulation. So my, my recommendation would, would actually to be have to have uh, a, a low level of fines, but to enforce it rigorously, so that uh, if if you do go over your time limit, you can be pretty sure, pretty sure, well assured you're going to get a ticket, but it's not going to be that uh, that expensive uh, a ticket. So. That's that's something you might want to uh, uh, give some some consideration to, and it, it wasn't part of our our jurisdictional scan, so I'm not sure what what other cities in, in New Brunswick are, are using, but but that could be something you might want to research a little bit more. Thank you, and I, again, I, I guess to just to make sure I'm I'm very clear, it's not the person who goes along at the dentist that uh, that is my concern, but the people that work in offices Monday to Friday from nine to five and park on the street for that entire time. Um, but I think within the report, you've given us good guidance on how to uh, mo move those folks into lots uh, over, as Councilor Rush Robinson mentioned, a year or two of a, of a transition. Um, I, one, one point I want to make is in regard to the staffing resource, uh, of course, we've started this year to engage bylaw officers. Uh, with the expectation that parking would become part of their mandate. So just the note would be um, that expense may not be as it appears on paper because in some ways it's already a sunk cost.